thank you for the introduction. So I'm Evelina, and I work in cancer research. But first, I have to say that I am not a biologist. I don't have any medical training. I am a computer scientist slash mathematician statistician. So my point of view will be purely from the system's perspective, from the statistics and mechanics of the system. So I'm doing my PhD at Cambridge University, and the work I will be talking about is basically a part of my thesis. And first, I will give you some background into what I'm working on. Uh, I'm working in an area that's called precision medicine. Another term for that is also the personalized medicine. So this is something like uh, standard medicine work, or works still in some areas. Uh, you have a lot of patients, and they all get diagnosed with the same disease, let's say cancer. And the doctors apply one standard approach. That's the same for all the patients, which obviously doesn't work very well, because not only there are different types of people, and different drugs work differently for different people, but also there are different types of the disease that don't behave in the same way. So ideally, we would like to have a situation like this. We get a cohort of patients, and then they get tested. And based on the result of the test, they get completely different approach, uh, completely different medicines. So uh, for some parts of the cohort, for some types of patients, they might get a surgery and then chemotherapy. That's a standard approach. Some might get something completely different. And I'm working on part of this research, and that means how to, uh, from a sample of a cancer, cancer tissue, how to see. Okay. Uh, so how we can find out what type of cancer patient has based on the sample from a tissue. So now I will take you through this diagram. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> this is just to show you how complex the problem is. This is part of our understanding of uh, cancer pathways, like biochemical and signaling pathways in cells. And yeah, this is a very high level view of our understanding of how cancer reacts and what types of genes uh, behave in what way. And most of current research uh, takes this approach that they study one part of the system from one point of view using one type of data. For example, they look at what genes are doing in the cell, and that gives you just one level view of this very complex process. So part of my research is how to actually get more data into this kind of, get more viewpoints onto this process. So this is what I'm working on, and I call it integrative clustering. And it's about identifying subtypes of cancer from multiple different data types. So this is just an example of four different data types that I'm working on right now. You don't have to understand them, actually. So I'll just change them into data. <laughs> uh, but those different data types uh, describe what genes are doing in cells what genes are being active during some process, or what genes are being silenced. And that gives us quite a lot of information about how the cancer behaves in the tissue. And most of the current uh, work was done by just looking at groups of uh, types of cancer within one data set or within another data set separately. And I'm working on how to integrate these different viewpoints together. And that should give us much better view on the big process. But I won't go into too much detail because this is uh, a talk at a functional programming conference. So I'll be talking about how I approach this from the point of programming. When you ask anyone working in my area what languages they use, they usually say they use R or Python or MATLAB. And that's just because most of people are researchers. They want to get the work done as quickly as possible. They are not interested in the programming itself. 
So when they start programming at school, during university, they usually pick up something that's very easy to use, where they don't have to take care of any constructs and classes and types. So these kind of languages give you very fast prototyping. They are not very fast in uh, terms of running it on large data sets. And I actually have some background in computer science. That's why I explored a bit further. And I use F Sharp, as the title of my talk suggests. So this is just an example why I chose F Sharp. This is an example of R code that I was using for something that I was comparing with my methods. And it had a bug in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine how painful it is to debug a code like this. Because almost all the variables have one letter names. And because this is in R, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with R, but there are different types of uh, data. It can be uh, saved as a vector, a matrix, a list, an array, or data frame. And all of these are accessed in almost the s exactly the same way. So when you look at a variable that's accessed through uh, square brackets, you have no idea what it is. And well, what functions can you actually apply to that? And May I have a little side question? Yeah, sure. Why would anyone use a language which looks like <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> now, this is R, and R is a programming language that was written for statisticians by statisticians. <laughs> yeah, I heard one joke where they said, well, try to compare it with something like a football stadium built for footballers by footballers. That doesn't really work very well. <laughs> So R is truly awful, but whenever there is some algorithm that is interesting for statisticians, it is written in R. So sometimes you just have to use it. But when I switch to F sharp, suddenly I get all these tooltips to every function I call, and suddenly I don't have to go through the whole code to find out what kind of variable I'm accessing or what kind of function I'm calling. And that's a major improvement. And once I tried F sharp, it was very, very hard to go back and write anything in R or MATLAB, anything like that. Yes? Uh, how about the statistical primitives that R offers and F sharp misses? I will get to that. <laughs> Bear with me. So, Another example, uh, I was trying to find some implementation of a numerical algorithm that does sampling from probabilistic distributions. It's called adaptive rejection sampling, which is not very important. And in that algorithm, you have to deal with convex hulls. So here I have some kind of function, and I have lower convex hull underneath the function. So far, so easy. The problem was that I couldn't find any implementation on the internet that didn't have bugs in it. This might have something to do with the languages they were used for that, but there is one implementation in R that everyone uses that was uh, rewritten from Fortran into C and then into R. And <laughs> it's just not a very good way to, use it, to do that. So I found one quite nice implementation in MATLAB. And yeah, this is like a standard procedu procedural code in MATLAB. And what this piece of code is doing, it's looking at this function. And it's uh, for every value of x, it tries to determine if it's uh, within some interval here between the points, or if it's outside on the right or outside on the left. And depending on that, we assign some function uh, or some value to the lower half value. That's very straightforward. And when I rewrote it into F sharp, suddenly I used something called active patterns, which make the code much more readable. Right now, I don't have to deal with this uh, if 
if x is larger than something or smaller than something else, uh, I can just write uh, pattern matching that will tell me where the x exactly is. If I actually switch into the code, The same complexity is still in there. This is basically almost the same as, as it was in MATLAB. But when I actually do pattern match on uh, the exact value of x, it's much more readable. So I know what's happening there. And if I go back to it like a year later, it will be very clear what's happening. And this is something called the active pattern because it basically calls a function that determines which type of result it is. We are back in the presentation. Also, uh, one type of bug that, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that when I was rewriting the MATLAB implementation, I found several bugs in it as well. And one type of bug was that they were assigning values to something based on a few conditions. And sometimes they forgot to assign the value. So in F sharp, this type of code looks very different. I don't have to assign the value to it inside some if uh, and else condition. I can just assign one single value and then all the complexity is within that. So if I forget to do something, I can immediately see it. So that helps tremendously. And that allowed me to actually fix the function and uh, I actually went back to MATLAB, fixed it for them as well. And there is actually one other implementation on the internet that's correct of this algorithm now. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, the code in F-sharp is much more legible. It's much more easy to understand. For example, this is just one function in, that I have to implement quite often that uh, allows me to basically perform one operation in a numerically stable way. And in mathematics, here, you basically have some values of xi, that you subtract a value from, then you exponentiate it, then you sum it, then you apply a logarithm. So when you look at the uh, equation written in correct mathematical way, it's actually quite difficult to find out what's happening. But in F sharp, thanks to the pipe operator, I immediately know that I can have some values of x, then I apply a function, then I sum it, then I apply a logarithm, and then I add a value. So it follows the natural way of thinking about what you are trying to do. And that's actually something that even people in R now recognize because they implemented the pipe into R as well. Well, back to my general research. Uh, when I do some kind of research, I usually start with a problem. In my case, it's the clustering of uh, cancer data. And then I come up with some probabilistic model, usually. And then I try to evaluate it. And to evaluate a model, that seems fairly straightforward, right? I have to use some external data. And that still seems quite innocent. But this part of the process is usually one of the worst because it's not very interesting and it takes much more time than it should. So, and it's not a problem only in cancer research. Yeah, no, this is just one tweet. Uh, it says that students uh, in a class, when they have a project, they usually propose something. We will solve computer vision. And 
uh, when it's time to do some presentation, they will say, oh, you got stuck pre-processing data. And that's another area where F-sharp is actually very, very useful. Uh, F-sharp has a library called F-sharp data that you can use to access all kinds of external data types. Typically CSV files or JSON XML files. And I will show you some examples. I'm not sure how to do it with the microphone now. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. <laughs> I will try to speak up. <laughs> Okay, so this is Xamarin Studio. And I'm running F Sharp on Mac, in case anyone still thinks that F Sharp is just a Microsoft language. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just show you. This is the type of data that I usually get when I'm analyzing anything. And this is uh, an example of clinical data about patients with breast cancer. And what I can do with F sharp data, I can create a CSV type provider. Yeah, whenever I, in Xamarin Studio, I highlight a line and I click Control Enter, it will get evaluated. That means it gives me the same advantages as normal scripting languages. It means immediate feedback. Uh, but I still get the type information and all the help that I can get from the compiler without actually even running the code. And now I will load the table I was showing you before. And I can look at information in the table. See, I didn't write any parser. This is just a very generic function that I can call. So, if I type clinical information, I can now access the rows in the table. And now if I do row dot, I will get all the information. These are actually names of columns in the table. So I get uh, the information about age of the patients when they were first diagnosed. I get uh, days to date of death, days to date of last contact, and all the information that is in the table without actually writing anything. And if I look at, for example, uh, how many people died, uh, I think I have the vital status in the table. Another thing is that uh, when the columns have some kind of character that you can't use in a method name, you will get these uh, backticks, and then you get the full string that is there as a column name. So it doesn't transform it into something that would be uh, suitable for a programming language. You can actually read normal, normal human language in there. So now I can evaluate it and we can see that the result is the sequence with diseased, diseased, diseased. So it seems that some patients, patients died. <laughs> we can have a look how many actually. And now we can take the length of the sequence. So, 93 patients out in the whole table died. And how many there are in total? 825. So, it is not that bad. It means that basically slightly less than 10% of patients died. Another thing is, I see that there are mostly men in the audience. So let's have a look if there are any men with breast cancer. <laughs> yeah. 
So do you, who thinks that men get breast cancer? Quite a lot of people, so let's check. <laughs> So I will again look at rows in the table, and I will try to find out. Let's map the rows onto the gender. And again, I can filter the results. So if the person is male, I will keep it. And then I can again take the number of people. So there are eight men with breast cancer in this data set. That means basically 1% of the people in this quite a small data set are men with breast cancer. So you are not immune either. <laughs> Another type of data I have to access quite frequently is uh, genomic data. And this is an example and this is an outcome out of a slightly bigger experiment I think they had 2,000 people in this cohort. And they were looking at genes, which have very cryptic names, code names, uh, and how do they basically behave during, or if they exhibit some kind of uh, enrichment or not in some process. So I will go through this a bit faster. Again, it's a CSV file, so I can just create a CSV type provider. And then I can access the data. I'll show you how many data points are there. And actually now there are uh, 30,000 genes, which is quite a big table. And I don't want to go and look for some information in something like that. And I will just show you again what type of information I can get. So for example, in a row, I can look at genes. I can look at gene description. And I can also look at things like um, let's say genomic location. And the thing is, what I get from the type provider, why is it actually called a type provider? Well, when I hover the mouse over any variable, it will tell me that this is a string. And maybe it shouldn't be because it's a location, but it probably tells me uh, which chromosome it is on. Or I can have a look at let's say, gain, and now the type provider knows that it's an integer. And this saves a lot of time as well when you are doing anything practical. So let's look at some example from the actual table. So these are names of genes and identifiers. And the identifiers actually lead to one quite big database of all genes. And I didn't want to do that. And this is the Ensemble website. That uh, whenever I need some information about a gene, I can go there, I can look it up, and it will tell me the coordinates and how the gene actually looks. But uh, I don't want to do that, actually. I want to have everything in my F-sharp code, right? If I want to see, if I have identifier for a gene, I want to look it up what the gene does, actually, from the database. 
And it's very easy because this database gives me an API access. And when you look at documentation of some REST service like this, they will usually give you example requests. And they provide example documents. So this is an example document. And what I can do, I can just take this address and pass it into a type provider. And it will give me a typed access to any JSON document with this structure. So here on this line, I'm actually creating a type provider to the database. And I really just passed in the website with the example document. And if I want to look at information about a gene, I can just create a query and send it to the website. And it will return the document. Here I decided to look at one gene that's uh, quite strongly associated with cancer. Actually, uh, Angelina Jolie, maybe you have heard about it, had a double mastectomy because she had uh, mutations in this gene and one other gene as well. And that increases the probability of getting breast cancer very, very much. And also, if men have a mutation in this gene, they are much more likely to get breast cancer and prostate cancer as well. So this is a very, very dangerous mutation to have. Luckily, not that many people have this mutation. I can have a look what type of information is in my table that I got from biologists. And here you can see I get the name, I get uh, some ID codes, I get a location which is on chromosome 13 between these base pairs and it's on the positive side of uh, the strand, which is not very useful right now, but I can have a look into the database. I will create a query. And then I send it. And what I got back is a valid JSON document. And you can see these are lists of exons in the, the genes. And yeah, I get a lot of information from that. And I don't have to parse the JSON document in any way. I can just, again, I have this variable BCRA2, and I just press dot. Oh, declarations list not yet available. Let's try again. Oh, now it's available. It took some time to parse it. And now I can access all the information that is in the database in the JSON document. So I can look at display name. I can look at the species. Let's look at species. And yes, it's homo sapiens. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, what other type of information can I get? Yes, but yeah. then the men should not be in. Okay. Sorry? Then only the women should be in. No, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> so I can also look at description. And it says that it's a breast cancer early onset gene, which it is. But I just wanted to tell you that, uh, well, there are libraries to access this database in almost any language, especially in R or Python. But I don't have to actually go and look up documentation for any package. All I did was that I downloaded, or I just copied the example document, and then I called uh, a query. And I got all the information. And uh, yes. It seems that, that you, have, you would have to probably parse and uh, load a lot of different documents for, for this kind of work. Uh, are the formats of the documents you receive change? Are they changing uh, 
as, as you receive more data, for example, you get, you get a data from another research facility which has a completely different format. And how, how do you handle this type of, because it seems like a nice thing, very, very useful, as long as the format of the document doesn't actually change, because then the whole program needs to be rewritten, basically. Uh, the question is, what if the format changes? Well, well, the way you create or use a type provider is that first you create a type, with some example document, like here. And you can use the document that you get every time as your example document. And then you get typed access to that. So you don't uh, have to actually do any parsers. You can just, uh, no, you assume that your example document has all the information. But if it doesn't, you can just use the document you are parsing as the example. And actually, when I was criticizing R earlier, um, yeah, I was criticizing R earlier, but it's a bit unfair because there is so much uh, implemented in R already. For example, for bioinformatics, there is Bioconductor, which is probably the biggest library of uh, various tools for bioinformaticians. So sometimes I have to use it. Luckily, in F Sharp, the type providers don't work only on documents and type documents. They work on languages as well. So there is something called R provider, which gives me access to all R functions within the F Sharp environment. So typically, I want to get some data, pre-process it, and then call a function from R and then continue with some processing of the data. And I don't have to save the data into some external document and load it in R and then load it back into F-sharp. I can stay in my favorite environment and just call the external R library. So for example, plotting. I, there are not many functions in .NET that would do decent plots. Uh, so <laughs> I use R, which has some quite good functions. That answers your earlier question. So for example, here I will look at, I will be looking at age distribution. Uh, that I find out by looking at my earlier example with the clinical data. And I will look at when do people actually get diagnosed with breast cancer most frequently. So I will look back into my data and from every row I will get hopefully the age at initial pathologic diagnosis. So when I evaluate it, I just get a sequence of numbers. And all I have to do is pass it into R. I just type R dot, and here I have all the functions that I have available in R that I can call. So I will just call our Q plot. <laughs> and now, hopefully, it created a histogram. <laughs> Yay. Oh no, this screen is a bit too small. So sorry, you can't really see the whole histogram. I but uh, basically the ages actually vary between 25 till 95 in this small data set. I can create different types of plots as well. For example, I can create a box plot, which I'm not sure. Oh no, this didn't work. 
Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure which box plot should I call. Or I can even call. I think I don't have the right uh, spaces open. And also, when I was mentioning calling any functions in R, I quite often have to do survival analysis when I look at the people uh, from, the, from the date of diagnosis to the current situation, if they are diseased or not. And in R, there are quite a lot of nice libraries for doing survival analysis. So I'll try to just show you a nice plot. Can't actually see everything here. Oh, I think I might have to restart it because I messed something up. So. Like again, I will load all my data that I need. And now I can actually, probably, hopefully, look at the survival. Here, if you are familiar with R, what I'm doing here is that I'm creating a data frame. This is a data frame from all my data that I extracted from the table. And it contains data on the time of the last contact or time of death and the status, if the person died or not. And now, here, I plotted the survival curve. If you have never seen a survival curve, uh, basically on this axis we have the probability that uh, patients in this cohort are alive at a certain time. On this axis there is time. So here uh, you can actually see the time axis, but uh, about after five years, uh, about half of the patients die usually in breast cancer, which is not very encouraging. I will go back to my I will go back to my presentation. So this is the plot I was showing you earlier. Here you can actually see the time. And yeah, I was just mistaken. After 10 years, about half of the patients die. But as I was talking earlier about the different types of patients and different types of uh, diseases, actually, this is an example of my research when I run my methods on the data I was showing you before, just from the information on what genes are active or what proteins are being produced in the cells. I can distinct, uh, basically split this one survival curve into several different ones that have completely different outcomes. For example, here up there, there are some types of patients where almost no one dies in 15 years. But there are some other groups of uh, patients that have more aggressive types <coughs> of cancer. For them, the outcome is much worse because the probability that they stay alive drops quite significantly very early on. And uh, when I do research like this and when I run my algorithms, there is another thing that I want to keep track about. And it's, uh, for example, how I set my uh, parameters or what type of, of functions do I call. So that's another area where F sharp actually helps me. And This is an example of a report that I can uh, actually produce from F sharp. Here I have something called journal and you can see it's exactly the same code I was showing you earlier. 
Only now I have some comments in there. And the comments are in Markdown. And when I run a script, it will produce a HTML document. I can also compile it into LaTeX and then into PDF. But now here I have all the code that I, sh I was showing you. And also I get all the tooltips, hopefully. Yeah, you can see this is a row. This is uh, an integer, things like that. So even if I'm unsure about something, I can look and I see what type, uh, what types variables have. And also, whenever my pro code produces something, it will include it in the report. Uh, these types of tools are available in R as well, or maybe in Python you use IPython notebook, but this uh, is, I think, very useful when you can see what types things have. And it will include plots as well. So here is the survival analysis, etc. And here are my genomic data. So, to conclude, thank you for listening to part of my research. And you can follow me on Twitter at EvelGAB. And I have a website where I blog sometimes, EvelinaG.com, and this is my email. And also a bit of advertising. If you are interested in F Sharp, there will be a F Sharp only conference in London on the 17th of April. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice and inspiring talk. Uh, do, you, do we have any questions? Many questions. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning. What are the volumes of data you usually analyze? And uh, is it a, do you encounter, encounter any uh, throughput problems? Like uh, the amount of data might be too much for, for the environment or for the analy you know, analytic uh, portion of, of your code? Uh, well, the volumes are, I wouldn't call them big data, but it's reasonably bigger. It's like when I was showing you the table with 30,000 rows, uh, I might get information for 30,000 genes for 2,000 patients. So it's uh, one big table. But uh, it still fits into the memory, so I don't have many problems with that. And the type providers that I was showing you, you can actually use like a version of the type provider that doesn't load the entire document, that actually loads the data when you need them. So it's much more memory efficient. Okay. Can you hear me? So uh, we have a data science team where I work and they also use one or two letter uh, variable names, <laughs> but they write stuff in Objective-C. So do you maybe have any tips I could I can give to them? I, because you know, if you write that in F-sharp, it has much better expressiveness. But Objective C, I think not so much. So maybe it's not worth the effort to change the names because they say that when they uh, come back to that code in, uh, in a few weeks, then can look up the math formula and uh, uh, variable names from the formula match the code. Yeah, I think that's the reason why people who have a background in mathematics actually use one letter variable names because it somehow corresponds to what you have in your equations. The problem is when you change the equation, then it no longer matches and suddenly you have completely cryptic variable names. I find this situation quite often. Uh, in the R code that I was showing you earlier, uh, actually the names didn't correspond to letters that we're using in the paper which made it really hard to understand. So maybe I, th I don't ha have any good advice. Maybe change all their variable names in their equations and then let them figure that out, that it's maybe useful to use more informative names. <laughs> uh, 
I think you learn this sort of thing through practice. Uh, can, you, can you recommend uh, any numerical statistical uh, library for uh, F sharp uh, apart from the uh, R uh, which you're using as a statistical uh, library? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm using math.net, which is an open source C sharp library. And it cooperates with F sharp very well. And it has uh, a lot of things for matrix and vector operations. And it has decent support for statistics as well. Uh, I just wonder uh, what uh, algorithm did you use for, uh, have you used uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, checking that? Uh, some cans, uh, genes uh, causing uh, breast cancer. If the, is that a testing hypothesis or, or you are uh, classifying them? Well, probability? I am running probabilistic clustering algorithms. That means I'm trying to identify subgroups of cancer that uh, express the same behavior across multiple different data types. Uh, I'm not doing any hypothesis testing. And the problem is that usually when you do this type of research, there is no ground truth. So you can't test it against that. You can only test if uh, your results have good predictive outcomes. Is there a uh, free access to Ensemble database? Could I uh, get data from it? Uh, yes, yes. You can just uh, look it up on the internet. There is free access. Okay, we have time for one last question, please. Uh, I would like to ask you, because you use Jamarin Studio on the Mac, and I'm not sure if there are any alternatives, as the .NET is becoming open source, but it's coming slowly, and I don't think Mono would support F Shop. So, uh, is there anything else you would recommend, rather than Xamarin, or Xamarin is the only option you can see now? Well, first of all, I don't see why Mono wouldn't support F Sharp. Uh, this is running on Mono, actually, Xamarin Studio, and it has very good support for F Sharp. And even, for example, this, uh, the formatting of the tooltips is much better in Mono than it is on Windows, actually. <laughs> uh, I know there are some packages for Emacs, uh, for F Sharp, and yeah, so far I've been using Xamarin Studio on a Mac, so I can't really tell you much, but yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I know there are many people working on like, support in different editors. I know there is some support in Vim as well. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. This is the last question, so we are running out of time. <laughs> uh, I was curious if there are any special libraries that allow you to use F sharp and prefer F sharp over something else. Are there any tools that make it easier to work with this kind of data and this kind of problem? Well, what F Sharp has that other languages don't uh, are the type providers. Uh, because, for example, in R, when you want to access some uh, CSV file and you get into some parsing problems, you usually spend half an hour just reading the documentation for the function that you want to call to load the document into your basically space. And in F Sharp, I don't have to go through that. And it's a great help to be able to access any sort of data file very quickly and to get some information about types in that. OK, we have to finish this talk. Thank you very much again. Let's thank you.